Well, hello and a big welcome to all of the teachers who've joined us here today. My name is Kim and I'll be your host for this one hour of professional development brought to you by the Australian Football League. We are really excited to be hosting this session and to introduce you to a suite of new resources for primary school teachers on teaching the fundamentals of AFL. This webinar is specifically targeted at exploring a fundamental movement skill that is crucial to the game of AFL, and that's, of course, kicking. I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which we are recording from today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land you are tuning in from and further extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending today's webinar. Let's begin with a few introductions. We are very fortunate to have Sam McKenzie joining us today. Sam is the coaching content and learning lead at the AFL and brings a great deal of wisdom and experience to the conversation. We also have Steph Kiochi contributing her insights during this session. Steph plays the position of midfielder and is the current captain of Collingwood's AFLW team, a position she's held for six seasons. And we have another Steph joining us today. Stephanie Pierce is online with us. Steph is the school's curriculum specialist at AFL. So a big welcome to the team and thank you for taking the time to join us to join us here today to impart your knowledge and wisdom to the teachers attending. A little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Throughout the session, we love to hear your questions. So please feel free to pop those into the chat box. Towards the end of the session, we'll have a dedicated Q&A time where our AFL representatives will be able to address any AFL questions you may have. Okay, let's get right into things. A quick overview of what will be covered in the next hour. We will review the learning objective and Steph Pearce from AFL will discuss the rationale behind the national program. We'll have a look at the pedagogical approach and then move into the heart of the webinar, which is teaching the fundamental skills. And this is where we'll hear from our experts, Sam and Steph. Following that, there'll be time for our Q&A and we'll finish up by discussing the supplementary leadership and healthy eating and nutrition resources that have been developed to work alongside the main AFL teaching and learning frameworks. Like any good lesson, we have some objectives for the session on screen here. The objectives of this webinar are to understand a range of strategies used to encourage play and support diverse learning styles within the HPE classroom to develop an understanding of fundamental AFL skills and know how to facilitate these with students in years five to six, and to learn from experts in the field through the sharing of best practice. And don't forget to add this hour to the maintenance of your professional development. To make life easier, we've linked this session to two outcomes of the professional standards for you. So now we're going to hand over to Steph, who will speak to the rationale behind the national program that's been developed for teachers. Steph, welcome, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Kim. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephanie Pierce, and uh, I represent the schools team at the AFL. And excitingly, we have today as an offering, um, but it is one of uh, many offerings that we are now incorporating into um, our programs and offerings. So excitingly. Um, we have a whole heap of teacher resources. We have a whole heap of prof professional learning opportunities. Uh, and it's great to be able to share that with teachers nationally. Uh, we decided to do this and take this on board because recently we'd surveyed teachers and found out what their greatest needs are and uh, uncovered what was probably uh, some information that a lot of people already know, particularly me having come from a teaching background myself, is that um, teachers, if they have the ability to have access to resources, we want them to be curriculum aligned and we want them to be educationally robust um, and include assessment tools. And that's what we've endeavoured to do. Um, we've had um, education staff um, 
co-create these resources uh, and have been through piloting programs and all with great results. So recently we've launched a new website that if you haven't had the chance to have a look at, you're welcome to go on and have a look. And that's where you'll see all of our uh, suite of resources um, located. So the website's play.afl slash schools. And on that, we've housed, as I mentioned, the resources themselves. We have links to professional learning. We have uh, the ability to become a member. If you haven't yet become a member of AFL schools, be, become one of um, our team. Uh, and we'll send you a newsletter, a newsletter so that you can also uh, be up to date with all of our upcoming resources. Uh, so excitingly, we hope that everything that we've delivered um, does showcase um, some of the great materials that have high are of a high quality and um, are curriculum aligned and have access to assessment components, which will all make um, your lives easier in terms of delivering health and physical education uh, content. Uh, and also, excitingly, we've delved into the other spaces, as Kim mentioned, around leadership and uh, healthy eating. So we're, we're, we're delving into other parts of the curriculum, um, including literacy and numeracy, so that we can give you a wide range of, of um, resources, all highlighting some of the great um, examples within the AFL. So uh, come on the journey with us. Um, and as I said, jump on the website and you can and see what we've got on offer. And we look forward to engaging with you in the future. And if not today, um, we have the professional learning um, opportunities like the Ashba conferences and some content on the website itself, including a learning management system. So look forward to engaging with you in the future. Thank you very much, Steph. Great to hear from you. When developing the resources, as you just heard from Steph, um, a few approaches were taken into consideration. So we'll just spend some time now discussing those. We'll have a look at Change It Up, Exploration, Free Play and Guided Discovery, and then we'll have a closer look at the resources available in, in the product. We know that classes are full of diverse learners. So Change It is an easy acronym for teachers to remember when considering how to modify games, skill building and activities in the PE classroom. It's worth pointing out here that there's no expectation to modify all of these aspects in a single lesson. You as teachers know your students, so we encourage you to think about what will be in their best interests. So let's unpack the acronym. C is for coaching style. Consider your own teaching style. Vary the questions, language and ways of communicating with your students. You can change how to score or win. Be inventive with different ways that students can do that. Area, by changing the area, the size, the shape of the playing space, we can make games more challenging or more simple for our students. Similarly, numbers, adapt team sizes and positions. Game rules, get creative with rules. Encouraging your students to help develop these fits with the curriculum and can also be a lot of fun. Equipment, we'll speak today about ways that we can adapt equipment, um, but give options and allow students to make their own choices where we can. Our I is for inclusion, modify to include all learners and abilities. Give options and ask the students for their input too. And time, increase or decrease time for games, activities, drills and reflections by observing and knowing your students. Each lesson of the Stage 3 Primary pro Program includes 5 to 10 minutes of exploration, free play or guided discovery. As you can see in this diagram, diagram play-based learning is a continuum with the focus shifting between the student and the teacher to, uh, leading the learning. The role of the teacher is to move between these different modes depending on the intended learning outcome. Exploration, free play and guided discovery provide students with an opportunity to explore and develop their skills in a less structured environment while maintaining support for their social, emotional, physical and cognitive development. So what's the difference between these terms? Free play or exploration is free from set or imposed rules or guidelines. 
Here, children have complete autonomy. Children and adults are just observers. Free play is a great way for students to explore new concepts such as how a football moves when bounced or kicked. The observations made during free play can be used to guide and shape lessons. Free play may also include playing with other sporting equipment, creating and initiating games, solving puzzles, chasing games and outdoor play of all kinds. Next along, we have guided discovery. This is teacher assisted and is a collaboration between teachers and students. Guided discovery is scaffolded in a way that has clear learning intentions, yet still encourages students to freely explore, wonder and problem solve within the context of new and unfamiliar ideas. Teachers work alongside students to initiate or create games or play together. During this type of play, teachers should aim to provide feedback, give demonstrations and comment on new discoveries made. Maybe we could try this. Can anyone suggest a way that we could do this differently? Oh, wow, what did you just discover? Guided discovery gives focus while still allowing students the freedom to explore. Games, of course, bring in more structured learning and are managed or observed by a teacher. But games have clear rules and boundaries while still promoting a sense of fun and playfulness. And then finally, outside the play-based learning zone, is structured learning. This is facilitated by teachers with a clear learning intention. In the context of the primary program, structured learning is used for building specific AFL skills. The primary program consists of a number of resources to assist both students and teachers in their learning and facilitation of the lessons. You'll see in the diagram that for teachers, there is an overview and preamble, which includes the pedagogical approaches we've just spoken about. There's lesson summaries, complete with coaching tips and ways to adapt for diverse learners and various opportunities for formative assessments have been embedded into the sequence of learning. All lessons are curriculum aligned to the national curriculum, as well as New South Wales and Victorian syllabuses. And for those teachers who are keen to do some summative assessment, there are ready to use rubrics again aligned to each curriculum. And then on the other side for students, there are worksheets for pre and post self assessment. Every lesson includes student success criteria and videos. And you'll see one of those today for both games and skill building. These double as instructions for teachers who would like to see the skills or games in action. And again, here, there are plenty of opportunities for self reflection. So that's a quick run through the pedagogy and the structure of the program. And it's now time to move into the exciting part of the session, teaching the fundamentals. It's a great opportunity for teachers to see the videos that are accessible within the program. So let's have a look at one of those now, learning how to kick. Welcome to NAB AFL Kick. Here are some tips on kicking. There are four steps required to perform a kick. All vertical, laces forward. Ball over your preferred leg, drop the ball, point your toes. To learn how to kick a footy, it helps to picture the ball as a face. So, meet Mr McFooty Face. The laces are his nose, the sides are his ears, the point on top is his hair, and the point on the bottom is his chin. Now, let's kick him. Hold Mr McFooty Face loosely by the ears so that he's vertical or up and down. His chin should be facing the ground, his hair facing the sky, and his nose pointing towards your target. Move the ball slightly off centre so that it's resting over your preferred kicking leg. Step forward with your non-kicking leg, and with relaxed arms, guide the ball straight down with one hand over your kicking leg. With pointed toes, kick Mr McFooty face right on his chin with your shoelaces. Follow through with your kick to try to get him to spin backwards. Once you've learned the basics of kicking, try taking two or three steps before kicking the ball. This will help with rhythm, momentum, distance and accuracy of your kicks. Think, step, drop, kick. And that's how you kick. So remember, the four steps are ball vertical, laces forward, ball over preferred leg, drop the ball and point your toes. Good luck.
another great video. Now, earlier in the week, I spoke with Steph Kiyochi to get her wisdom on how to teach the skill of kicking. Let's hear what she had to say. So, Steph, this is the fundamentals of playing footy. What advice would you have for teaching this particular skill? Well, this is the fun part, isn't it? This is what the kids want to be doing. They uh, always want to be kicking. Um, and, and usually, like, when I'm teaching football, you, you start with the ground balls and the handballing and all they want to do is kick. So this is where it gets fun. Um, firstly, I know we talk, we've spoken about it in the past webinars, but ball handling is really important and ball place, uh, hand placement on the ball. Um, so giving the students that opportunity to explore um, how they want to hold the ball. And, and obviously we talk about the one-handed ball drop in the future, um, but it's okay to start with two hands um, like any of the other skills. And, I like the analogy with the ears and the face because it gives them a, a really good um, focus point. There's a really good activity you can start with um, once you've done some ball handling activities um, is to play like a ball security game. Um, and you can actually get the students to hold the ball how you would want to hold it when you're kicking. Um, and you obviously demonstrate that. And you can play in a little, little area and it's about trying to knock the other students' balls out of their hands. Um, so... It's a little bit of fun because obviously it's, a, it's competition, but it's also getting them to hold and grip the ball how they should be doing it. Um, and I find that's really worked well in the past. So even if it's just a little 30 seconds, you have to go around, try and knock students' balls out of their hands. Once that, just pick it up and continue on. And you get a point for every time that you knock someone else's ball out of their hands. Um, probably re refrain from um, getting negative points when yours falls out. It's more about um, obviously getting points when you do that. So that's a good little intro activity. Um, you would have seen on the video, a lot of the students, a lot of the kids were holding the ball quite um, horizontal. It's really important that it's held vertical. And a little tip that I give with kicking is to actually over-rotate the ball. Um, so I find that students are over-rotated are less likely to then kick it horizontally because naturally we move the ball that way. Um, so naturally we flick the ball up. So if you can over-rotate it and sort of have your wrist over your thumbs, um, I find that to be a really good teaching tip um, that not many people talk about. So starting with that, so you've got your hand placement, over-rotate it and kicking the ball to yourself first, which is a little bit harder than it seems. Um, and that's obviously not pointing your toe. That's more so pointing your toe up, which is probably a bit contradictory to the actual skill itself, but it's a really good starting point for A, ball drop. So holding it over your dominant, um, dominant leg, placement, and then watching the ball hit your foot and then trying to get it spinning the right way. Then you can obviously progress to that step um, lowering the ball and, and kicking the ball by pointing your toe, which is probably one of the, the toughest skill um, components of that skill. Um, kicking in partners is always a, a good progression, especially at that sort of upper primary school level. Um, obviously, that, that's a big part of our game. So to actually kick and hit a target is a progression. And there's a good little activity that can be done with that where probably stand about five minute metres apart to start with, so a real controlled um, environment there and every time that there's a kick and a mark students can take three steps back um, so obviously that adds that competition element um, it's a little bit of a challenge if there's a dropped mark or the, the ball doesn't hit the target take one step in so yes it's it's coming back in but it's not going all the way back in so there's still that element of they're actually getting some distance on their kick um, and I find that that activity is, is really beneficial some things to look out for is obviously holding the ball incorrectly. The laces at the front um, is a really good cue for students um, because it's quite obvious where they sit um, and throwing the ball when they kick it. Um, so the biggest point um, for that would be to actually watch the ball hit your foot um, and keep your hands on the ball for as long as possible. As they progress, the one-handed ball drop is paramount to the skill. Um, and it's really important that the balance arm is out to the, to the side. Um, and you can obviously show and demonstrate that and show them some footage of that um, online um, of some of the best kicks in the game. Um, but, yeah, a great skill and a lot of fun. And, you know, if you can master that, then, you know, you can play many, many games and have shots on goal and other different challenges. 
right? And, and obviously we're talking about slightly older students here today. Um, so we're going to have an even bigger range of ability in the group. We'll have some kids who really are just learning to kick and some have been kicking forever. Um, how do you handle that in a, in a classroom? Yeah, it's important to differentiate um, with anything that we do. And it could be as simple as having stations and having sort of like a bit of a tabloid going on with different skills. Um, and, you know, use your use your judgment and your assessment to, to group students in, in maybe their ability groups. Um, you don't have to make it too obvious, but you're always going to have a, a wide range of, of abilities. Um, so, if it, you know, you have your I suppose your beginners, it's not so autonomous for them um, to the, those that are thinking um, more associatively with it and then your autonomous group um, and you can just have them working together and working off each other. Um, you can also have the more experienced um, students working with the, the students that are beginning um, and, and sort of displaying how they do it and, and sort of peer teaching, which is, you know, a big part of the curriculum as well where they get to work with others um, and just, you know, obviously that, that feedback, that instinctive, instinctive feedback and that direct feedback at the time is really important. Um, but definitely, you know, setting them up for success is important and, um, you know, you can always progress them through different levels after that. Great, great suggestions. And, and then I guess the extension of this is getting the ball to rotate backwards, yeah. uh, which is, is something that some kids will be ready for, but maybe some teachers aren't quite ready for how to teach that. Is there any tips from you on, on how we can coach them to keep the ball with that backwards rotation? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because that's probably the part of the skill that is most difficult along with pointing the toe and getting it to, to hit a target and not be too loopy. Um, the, the activity where whereby they kick the ball to themselves will encourage that backward, backward spin. Um, and that over rotation of the hands, I can't stress that enough, um, especially in the beginning stages, that will naturally help the ball rotate the way it should. Um, it, similar to the handballing activity we spoke about previously, if you're kicking the ball to yourself and catching it, obviously it's getting those the hand motion ready, uh, but it's also encouraging that backspin and then doing little claps to catch. Um, that's always a good little progression there. Um, you can obviously use a different ball um, whilst a soccer ball obviously is round it can still spin backwards so that's probably a good starting point as well for some people um, but just reiterating to the students that, you know why do we want the ball to spin backwards um, and sort of having a focus area on that and the reason is it's easy to catch and it's easier to kick um, so I often say why do we want the ball to spin this way not like this and get them to sort of critically critically think about that um, and then just let them have that free play um, let them go and do their thing and, ex and experiment with the ball drop and things like that um, and really encourage that backward spin. Indeed, some great ideas. And we have live with us today, Sam McKenzie, and uh, Sam's going to share his insights uh, into this critical skill. So welcome, Sam. Great to have you here. And Thank you. We've seen a great video. We've heard from Steph. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps go in a little bit further into the smaller breakdown of steps that might be needed in this process. So, uh, you know, do we do we encourage kids to to step and drop, ball hit the ground? What what are the tips? What breakdown do you recommend? Yeah, yeah probably just to start with, um, I think kicking. There are a lot of different ways that people kind of think about how you might coach kicking. Like, there's a lot of stuff out there um and certainly there's no one right way or, or wrong way um and there's there's never any sort of a wrong drill or a wrong activity or anything like that because it's all dependent on what you're trying to achieve and what the learning outcome is um as i'm sure the teachers out there will will know from you know creating lessons and what they do um i guess firstly just to give a bit of an idea for myself like the way i look at teaching kicking is that um, you're trying to teach kicking as a, as a fully rounded skill. So people might say, oh, you know, there's drop punts and snaps and bananas and, and dribble kicks and all of this sort of stuff and torpedoes. Um, I sort of look at it as though there's kicking, which is just striking the ball with your foot um, and kicking from hand. So dropping the ball from your hand onto, onto your foot. Um, and rather than breaking it down into all those ones, you're actually just trying to teach players how to get the ball where they want it to go to with their foot. 
Um, so that's just kind of like a bit of an idea to start with. So, so I don't necessarily think about it breaking it down into the different types of things you're going to do. It's actually just teaching them what happens when you kick the ball this way or what happens if the ball's slightly tilted? Where does it go? What part of your foot do you need to hit it with? Does that change when you're trying to bend the ball around the corner compared to when you're trying to kick in a straight line or you're trying to pass the ball or trying to get it as far as you can go? Um, so... When you're sort of breaking, when you then go to break um, down the steps that you're going to use to, to help, um, that mo- the way I sort of think about it is that, I mean, anything can go because you're just trying to help the kids explore and figure out what they're trying to do. Um, the two kind of key things, uh, the ball drop and the where the ball meets the foot is actually probably the one and most important thing that you've got really because um, it's all about the impact point of the, of the foot. And so the ball, your hand and your ball drop, helps you get the ball to your foot where it needs to be. Um, so like a like I know the um, the old step and drop, um, which is very just sort of traditionally drop punt focused because you hold the ball straight, you drop it down. Um, if, if your kids are really, really struggling with dropping the ball straight, then, yeah, that can be a really good activity. Um, so I'm sort of loathe to say that anything's um, bad, but I guess for me the way in which I would go about teaching the skill is that ball striking the ball striking the foot is kind of the most important thing so how about we start there um and so even with like really little kids like i know we're sort of talking about older kids today but even little kids i mean just starting with can you just kick the ball off the ground like starting with that because really the, the skill is striking the ball with your foot so can you do that and then we'll add in some of the complexity that comes with um dropping the ball from your hand i'm sure I've done a lot of coaching with six and seven year olds and there's nothing quite like waiting for the, the kids sort of, you can almost see their brain ticking over. How do I get this ball here onto my foot down here and swing it to get it over there? And they kind it's like, a, they kind of got this for a little bit. Um, and so, you know, there's, a, there's some added complexity there. And so really you're just trying to encourage them just to start off with, well, let's just get impact point on the foot with the ball dropping out of your hands and then let's go from there and figure out um, what we need to do and, and what you're trying to achieve um so yeah so the first part is i guess i would just encourage making sure that there's ball on foot um and what if you've got that then you might start layering in some of the other things depending on what the kids need and then their struggle might be so it might be kicking the ball with a bit of backspin so how do we go about teaching that um it might be oh, trying to get distance and we'll we use the term penetration, so trying to get it, it going hard and fast um, forwards. So what are we going to do to help you do that? So there's sort of some of the things that you might look for. And I'm sure as we kind of chat through some of these other things we'll discuss, we'll kind of start giving you some examples for those sort of things, what we might um, do or you might look for as a coach or teacher to help them out. Yeah, I, I really love this approach, Sam, because it's it's not about – having a textbook kick from the start. No. It's about exploring what happens to the ball when it hits my foot. And, and I, I love yeah. the use of the free play and exploration in that. Yeah. And I mean, if you go, like if you took like a, say AFL or AFLW players, if you took a cross section of them, they would not be, they do not kick the same. Mm. Um, you know, there are some, fun, there are some fundamental things that help you to achieve certain types of kicks. There are some sort of commonalities, but if all, all of the players kick, kick differently um and they've sort of figured out what works for them so they've had to explore that as well and figure out what can help them to be an expert kick and a, an elite kick of the of the footy so um there is no one perfect model and and the exploration allows like i look at someone like eddie bet so i love watching eddie bets play and he can do things with the the footy that are like absolutely magic but he will have explored you know i can't speak for how he learnt the game, but my assumption would be that there was a lot of exploration and down at the down at footy ovals, trying to bend the ball around different things, which allowed him at the elite level now to be able to get the ball. And he's so comfortable with where the ball is, and he instinctively will know. I just put the ball there and I kick it. I think he he won't even really think about it um, because he's had so much exploration to figure out. He understands the footy. An oval footy, which is an awkward thing to kick, he really understands all the different angles that you can kick without actually having to think about it. Um, and that's what we want um, to allow the kids to kind of figure out and go, oh, if I kick, if I bend the ball like this and I kick it, it spins that way. That's pretty cool. Like I might do that if I'm in a pocket down here in a game. So yeah, that, that exploration, especially for kicking, I think is really, really important. 
and and of course it arms the kids for when they're playing a game and yes. it's not predictable where the ball is going to be going and which way they're facing yeah exactly yeah, yeah. So, and we, we sometimes do train it um thinking that it is predictable but it's not and so you ha- you actually to give your kids the best chance and you know this is we're talking probably a little bit older here but to give your chance the best give your kids the best chance in a game um you actually need to set them up to be able to achieve whatever they need to achieve whatever the situation um um arises so we we kind of want them to be able to to manipulate the skill so that they can get the ball where it needs to be at the right time yeah and and so i see this free plan exploration as a, a little bit of a formative assessment moment for teachers to be observing what's watching what's happening and and seeing those those kind of errors i suppose uh, that, yeah. that a, a number of students are making and then turn that into a teachable moment and and i guess one of the things that we see a lot with primary school students particularly those who haven't had much football experience is the throwing up the ball yeah, yeah. before they kick it. Um, and I, I I guess hearing, you know, they take that time that you were just mentioning about with the, their head trying to make it work. And maybe they think by throwing it up, they're giving themselves some more time, but it doesn't work like that. How, how do we deal with kids who are throwing the ball right up before they Yeah. Um, so so I, I really love challenges. So I, like the way I look at skill is um, because because I guess we don't we don't take a perfect model approach. There's sort of not really one way to do it. So I really like challenges. So, for example, for a, for a kid who might be throwing the ball up, um, one thing, if you throw the ball up, you're going to struggle on a couple of things. So one is kicking the ball, like, with a bit of backspin on it. So if you're trying to do what would be a, like a traditional drop punt, um, which is a really effective kick for accuracy. Um, and so, you know, we pass the ball with it, we shoot at goal um, from set shots with with a drop punt that spins backwards because it is it's much more accurate than some of the other types of kicks that you'll use what what you might go is oh, okay well if you're spinning the ball up we can't see that so like steph was talking about well why don't you kick the ball to yourself so i just want you to kick the ball because by kicking the ball to yourself so if you go to kick it up the ball will spin but if you throw it up it's actually really hard to then get your foot to the right point to go up so the challenge for them is i want you to i want you to kick the ball up and then catch it and that might be a really simple challenge for them. So you're not telling them, hey, you must hold the ball exactly like this and sort of put it on your foot. You're just giving them a challenge. And then you and then you as the teacher, your role is that guided discovery to go, oh, well, what happens if you throw it up? Oh, well, the ball, the ball spins around when I throw it up, which means I can't get the bottom of the ball, which is where I need to kick it to get that spin so it stays here. Yeah, oh, that's a really, okay, so how can you not throw it up? What can you do? Um, another challenge might be, trying to get them to kick under something you might put a you might get a couple of poles and put a bit of rope between it or a bit of string and you say all right i want you to kick the ball under that rope now if you throw the ball up typically what will happen is you throw the ball up when you go to swing your leg through so if this was my leg the, you throw it up and your leg meets the ball here and so you end up kicking it really high so you end up getting really high loopy kicks um, as well so just by the challenge of okay now i need you to lower and i want you to kick it flatter they'll have to start net instinctively most kids will realize after a few goes of not getting it right that they have to maybe get over their kick a little bit more they need to drop the ball closer to the ground which allows the, the them to hit the ball lower to the ground which keeps it flatter so there's some challenges that allow you to kind of they're like the constraints you know the constraints sort of approach they allow us to then um, work on some of the things that we're seeing but it also means you don't really have to be an expert in in kicking because you can sort of see, you can have a few challenges in your up your sleeve or in your back pocket that you can use. Where if you're seeing a few things like, oh, that's a loopy kick. Okay, well, actually, one thing I can do is I might get them to kick it to themselves, or I might get them to kick under a rope, or oh, they're not this this um, child doesn't really get any backspin, so I'll get them to kick it to themselves, or try and another one for that one is to try and be really close to a, um, some form of a crossbar or anything, and you kick it up and try and get it to kick up and over because you end up getting quite a, to do that, you have to have, to have quite a bit of backspin. Um, so there are little challenges that you can create and you can be as creative as a teacher as you want, thinking in it, it's really just like a teaching um, thought process. What's the problem that I'm seeing? Oh, they're, they're doing this. Okay, so what's a way that I can get them or encourage them to do it in a different way and you put the constraints around them and then let them go and let them figure out um, for them what's the best way to solve that problem. 
Yeah, terrific. Some great suggestions there. I love the idea of all those different challenges and uh, we might pick up on some of those uh, again in just a moment. But we're going to move on to the second skill today, which is uh, kicking again, but uh, this time kicking along the ground. So um, we did catch up with Steph earlier in the week. Let's have a look at what Steph said about this skill and then I'll come back to you, Sam. Now, our second skill today, we don't actually have a video for, and it's a bit of an unusual skill, and that's kicking along the ground. We uh, we see on the television the ball being kicked through the air all the time, and we know that's a big part of the game. Steph, why would we be kicking along the ground, and how do we coach kids to do it? Yeah, another really tough skill. I feel like a lot of our um, game skills are tough, but a lot of fun, this one. So we see the likes of, you know, the Dacos brothers kicking the ball along the ground and kicking goals and things like that. Why would we kick the ball on the ground? Well, it could give you advantage forward. Um, the, the beauty of our game is that the ball is oval and it spins in all sorts of directions. Um, but if you can master the kicking the ball on the ground, you can kind of get it to where you want it to go, um, especially if you've got pressure coming at you and that sort of more game sense situations. Um, you know, you can get the ball moving the way you want it to go and you can get it going left, right, straight and all those sorts of things. So it is a really important skill. It's probably not something that's utilised too often um, in the game, but you often see forwards um, practising their craft and, and using the ball to spin along the ground if they're caught in positions that are, you know, on angles, if they're having shots on goal or if they need to uh, avoid th their opponent from smothering the ball and things like that. So it is a lot of fun. Uh, I know that we spend a lot of time having shots on goal from the pockets because that's where you'd most likely do these types of kicks. Um, and it's really important if you want to surge the ball forward in conditions that might be, you know, not preferable, like very windy um, if, it's a, if it's a wet day um, and things like that. So it's a really beneficial skill. Um, if you can get the ball spinning the way you want it, um, it'll be even more beneficial for you. Terrific. And it's um, is, is there anything from a safety perspective with kicking either in the air or along the ground that we should be considering? Yeah, well, I think in terms of you're going to have to have a really strong toe point to do this. Um, and a lot of kids um, try and overcompensate by kicking distance and kicking really hard and they can actually hit their toes into the ground. So that's really something to consider um, and just talk about the sweet spot and the, their ability to not have to kick the absolute cover off the ball, but just be really controlled with it. Um, obviously with the bouncing ball, if there's students around the area, you know, it, it can be unpredictable and, you know, you might cop a falcon or something like that. So in an environment where there's a lot of space would be something that I would definitely consider. Um, but again, it comes back to exploration with the, with the footy. If you can have students have a bit of free play and have their own space to practice this skill, um, that would be beneficial for that. Terrific. Thank you. No worries. So... It's a bit unusual that we need to do both of these things. And as you've said before, uh, lots of exploration, lots of different situations during gameplay. But what are the key differences in the process for kicking the ball along the ground compared to kicking it in the air? How do, how do we teach kids how to do those two different approaches? Yeah, so again, I guess it kind of comes back to, you know, I, I sort of look at kicking, kicking, with you kicking along the ground, kicking a drop punt, torpedo. Um, so really the, the, the main difference is that what you're trying to achieve with it is going to change the way you hold the ball and where you might kick the ball um, on your foot. And so really the, the main difference for me is that just how you, you, how you hold it and how they'll hold it and, and where the impact point is, they're going to be the, the key differences, which just go, which all go back to is what are you trying to do? So um, I know sort of sometimes when we think, you know, kicking the ball along the ground is actually just kicking a ball along the ground it, potentially is a little bit easier than actually kicking it, trying to kick it in the air and find someone. Cause you can just say, just want you to kick it along the ground and see what the ball does because it's an oval shaped ball. It spins and it does lots of things. In fact, that moves a little bit counterintuitively um, when you're trying to, if you're trying to bend the ball around corners, um, but they're really fun activities for the kids to do. You can put some things and say, I want you to try and bend the ball around, have a go, figure it out. Um, so where you, how you might hold the ball, where you, where you put it on your foot, what you're trying to do. Um, I mean, they're, they're the key differences, but it's much the same as if you're going to try and snap the ball. What are the key differences for that? Well, it's just how you hold the ball and where you 
where you make contact on your foot. Um, but I, I, I really love uh, sort of the kicking along the ground or dribble kicking, de- depending on your terminology, um, because you can bend it and it can do some really fun stuff. And so you can have some really cool challenges for the kids to try and figure out and it's one of those ones that's really good at start getting the kids to start to understand if I hit the ball, this part of my foot, where's it going to go and what's it going to do? Um, so a really, really good challenge um, activity. So is it a prerequisite to be kicking the ball in the air first? Is that, do you want to get that right before? No, I, 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 like I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't worry about, you know, there's a picking order or anything like that. Like, again, as I say, kicking's kicking is um, kicking. So you can give it to them at any point in time. Like I said, it's a pretty good one for trying to figure out what the ball does when you move around. I know some, I think some people sometimes think that it's kicking the ball on the ground means you have to bend it. But I mean, you don't just kicking the ball along the ground kicking is kicking the ball around. They can kick straight. They can do whatever they want. Um, so I, I don't think that there's a prerequisite for, for either of those. This is again, part of that whole, well, we're just trying to create a really well-rounded skill. And if you want, um, a child to become an, an expert or master the master the skill, um, the, the ones who will will be the ones who almost have like an intuitive understanding because of all the exploration and the, all the all the repetitions they've done with a bit of variation um, of if I put the ball here, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, you, you mentioned that word intuitive. Um, so we'll get kids in gameplay who will just intuitively know which is the right kick at the right time and and where to place the ball because they've done all that exploration is that is that a skill that can be taught as well yeah a hundred percent um I, like i believe it. intuition really just comes from experience so the, it's the experiences that you you sort of have and you get put in that allow you then when the situation arises you that's where your intuition comes from um and so if you're wanting to train this or give opportunity for so that kids know, okay. And I would, I would extend this out to not just dribble kicking, but all kicking um, in terms of what kick is required in what situation, then you need to put them in situations where they can get lots of repetitions and in, in game like situation. So that doesn't mean playing a, you know, a 12 on 12 or 15 on 15, that could be a, a three on two sort of activity um, where they get lots and lots of repetitions but they're seeing lots of different scenarios and they have to try and figure out what what they're going to do and remembering that um, learning takes time Um, you know learning is a permanent change in behavior so we can't look at learning in one lesson we've got to look at learning over a long period of time Um, and so they may not be great they may not have great coordination with it. They may have um, a lot of sort of what we would call bad variability. So the bad variability is stuff that's not helping them um, get the ball where they need it to go. Um, but over time, that bad variability comes down and they become quite coordinated. And then over a longer period of time, they then actually get what we call good variability. And so that good variability is the stuff that allows them to pick the right kick at the right time in the right situation. Yeah, I like that. That's a good way of thinking. Now, we're going to keep you here, Sam, but I'm just going to alert people that are watching that if you'd like to ask a question, that you can pop it in the in the chat box and we'll ask Sam your question. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm keen to know, uh, you know, we've, we've actually in this series of webinars covered a lot of skills. And how, how much time do you think needs to be spent on, on kicking? Is it, is it the big one or uh, are the others just as important um oh i mean i think as steph said in her um in her little bit before you know they the kids love kicking you know everyone sees it it's a it is a one of the you know the key fundamentals in the game and what sort of separates um our game the, you know the kicking for passing as well as um you know to hand so I, I think it's a really awesome skill to spend a lot of time on um and certainly in terms of the more time you spend on it the probably the better the kids are going to be off for kicking but all the other skills are important too so really it's just looking at your group and, and what do they need um and what do they enjoy and then tailoring um what you're doing for them as well like i, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule around you must spend this much time on each of them um, certainly look at your group and, and figure out what, you know, we want to be learner centered. So figuring out what they, what they want and what they need, and then kind of creating the balance for that as well. And then as you talked about, you know, assessing 
where they're at and then figuring out, well, we probably need to spend a little bit of time on this because that's going to help them to enjoy the game more because they're going to become more competent and confident um, in those skills. Yeah. Now, now, Steph touched on this about the students who want to kick the ball really hard and far and end up, you know, messing up the process. And we, we talk about the sweet spot. Yeah. Um, what's the sweet spot? How do, yeah. how do we help uh, students learn to, to kick further and harder? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer and, you know, um, actually, just practice kicking long, like at very, at very young ages, like just get them to kick it as hard as they can. Um, you know, like it's actually a really hard skill, especially for younger kids to kick accurately, you know, because to slow down a skill for anyone is actually like the, as you can slow it down and become more accurate, that shows a sort of a, again, a level of competence or a level of mastery over the skill. So I, I'm a big believer in just get them kicking as hard, as fast as they can. Tends, what tends to happen is that to actually do that really well, um, you kind of, your body self organizes and starts to figure some things out. And so you can get them. And again, especially if they learn young to kick it hard and fast, they probably keep that um, ability. So, you know, they might be when they get a bit older and they get a bit bigger, they might be able to kick it 50, 60 meters, which is um, a really awesome skill. And then you can start to narrow it down and start working them with them on their accuracy. But certainly um, sometimes I think we make the mistake that early on we go, okay, get into pairs and you're going to kick five meters to each other. But that doesn't really teach what an actual kick, like the actual kicking motion is like. And sometimes um, you probably want to get them into like a full kicking motion and just not worry about accuracy and just say, just want you to kick it as hard and fast as you can. And then we'll start to explore how do you get the ball to spin backwards in the air? How do you get to bend it? All those other things. So, yeah, I would encourage like long first, long and hard first, get it out. And then we'll start to narrow it down once um, once we kind of figure that out. Yeah, a lot of sounds like a lot of chasing of footballs going on there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now uh, we've got a great question to finish up on. Um, Steph did mention one of her favourite games is that we used to call it forcey backs. If you catch it, you can take a step back. If you miss it, take a step back in forwards. Do you have a favourite kicking game or drill that you love to use that that students enjoy as well? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I love some of the fun ones, like uh, if we're using, um, and sometimes this isn't necessarily just an activity, this might be something to set up before um, training. So there's a couple of things. Sometimes um, some of the ones, I mean, I love the exploration and letting kids have, figure it out and then just kind of being there as a guide. Um, so sometimes you might play a bit of kick tennis, um, or sorry, kick golf. So kick golf, um, you might set up some, you might have a, um, a wheelie bin if you've got one of those, or you might have... Um, some cones that you can set up and you just set them up around the ground and you say, all right, you've got to try and hit that cone and you, you've got to do it in as few kicks as possible. And so that allows them to try and kick lots of different things. You might, you might have a light, a light tower or something like that, that you can kick at. And so you use that and, and then it allows, and then just let the kids go. So they kick it, chase after the ball, have another kick, see how many they can do it in. And then that will practice. If it's a long way away, they've got to try and kick long. Then they might try and dribble kick because they're trying to hit it, um, so it allows them to explore, um, which is just a really sort of fun activity. And if you set it up a few times and let them go at it um, before training, and then other other ones you might use, um, I love using different types of equipment, so using tennis balls or soccer balls um, or little footies. They're really, really cool activities and, cha and to change it up and, and play those sort of, even in a game, you might do some sort of keepings off or something like that, but you use different um equipment and give them different values for how many points you get if you if you kick the tennis ball and you can catch it it's worth five points and if you can kick the soccer ball it's worth two and the footy's just worth one or you can vary the scoring depending on what you're trying to work on I think there, there's some really fun things it just sort of throws a bit of variation at the kids but again it's all with the focus of creating that well-rounded um, kicking skill yeah brilliant so many wonderful uh bits of advice and uh great great options as well so thanks so much for your time sam that's been no, terrific. thank you now one of the bonuses of this program is that as well as the on-field learning teachers can also take the learning into the classroom with the off-field module this is a lesson focused on building leadership skills we have another video to share with you now that you can use with your students um, and it gives you a taste of what's covered in the classroom lesson so it's uh featuring the wonderful steph let's have a quick look 
Steph, thanks so much for talking to us today about leadership. My pleasure, Brody, and welcome, Javindu. Really looking forward to talking about leadership. Steph, what's your definition of leadership? Great question. Uh, I think there's some key words when it comes to leadership, and they are respect, responsibility, um, and building relationships with people. But leadership for me is about behaving in a way that you'd like to behave and others to behave and paving the way for them to do so. What do you think, Brody? Um, I think leadership is being kind and respectful and showing others what the right thing to do is. And are you a leader at school, Brody? Uh, yeah, I am the sports captain. Excellent. Is that for the whole school or for a particular colour? Uh, for the whole school. Wow, great responsibility. What about you, Javindu? Do you have any leadership roles at school or outside of school? Not really, but I do try to like act like a leader to, to make an example. Excellent. And it just goes to show you don't have to have the title of a leader to be a leader, do you? I think my most rewarding leadership role is being the captain of the Collingwood Football Club and being the inaugural captain. So being there at the start, I got to be involved in the first ever AFRW game against Carlton at Icon Park. And I've seen our group and club develop over the years. And I like to think I've played a small part in that. Can you tell us the qualities that make you a good leader? I think the qualities that stick out for me uh, communication and being approachable, so someone that you can go and talk to, um, but is also willing to listen to what you have to say. And talking the talk and walking the walk. So what I mean by that is they let their actions do the talking. So they speak really well and they know what to do, but they actually do it as well and they lead by example in that way. What do you think the best qualities of a leader are? I think the best qualities of a leader are uh, like setting an example for everyone and doing the right thing as much as possible. Excellent. And what about you, Brody? I think kindness, respect and integrity. Fantastic. Great word, integrity. And I love respect. It's very important to be respectful of yourself, um, your peers and the people in your environment as well. When have you had to step up as a leader? It's a great question. I think there's many a times you have to stand up as a leader in, in a football team, whether it's on the field when things aren't going your way. Uh, or whether you face adversity off the field. We had a few girls who were injured last season, myself included, and we had to be really resilient. Um, we needed to band together and, you know, make sure that we stayed on top of what we were doing um, and kept positive. And I think that's when, you know, my leadership came through um, to try and bring other people with me and they also helped me out as well. What's your greatest accomplishment as a leader? It's a good question. I would love for it to be winning a premiership with my teammates, but we haven't got there quite yet. So I think it'd have to be navigating through the past few seasons, which COVID has impacted, and just making sure that the girls stayed positive during those times. We had a lot of challenges thrown at us, but I think the ability for us to respond appropriately was really good. And we also made finals for the first time in that time. So uh, making a final series amongst all those challenges was definitely a huge accomplishment for our football team. Steph, how do you lead your teammates to achieve a common goal? I think it's really important that you work together. And as a leader, you need to be across all the information, whether it's game plan, um, the roles, how we want to play the game and things like that. So anything that the coach and the information the coach gives us, I need to make sure that my teammates are on the same page with that. And that just comes from communicating and making sure that you know, you're checking in with them, making sure they understand. And if they don't, then ask questions. And it all comes back to that relationship building and having a good rapport with others. And finally, Steph, what advice would you give us kids if we wanted to be leaders? I think it's really important that you're true to yourself and you know what your strengths are. And one thing that someone told me once is that you don't have to tick all the boxes as a leader. So you can be really good at some things and then maybe not so good in other areas, but that's when you need to rely on other people and talk to other people um, and get that help. Don't be afraid to get help from others to be a really good leader. Hey Steph, thank you so much for chatting with us today. No worries at all. Thank you for your great questions. Such great videos and those are available for each of the levels and you can see the progression of the concepts of leadership. So really worth having a look at. The off-field lesson for year five and six is a project that can be done in small groups or as a class. This lesson focuses on leading together and is a project-based learning opportunity. It's called Project Make a Difference, and it encourages students to partake in an authentic learning experience that has benefits for themselves and, <coughs> and others. The initial lesson is 40 minutes or so and includes relevant vocabulary, learning outcomes and student success criteria built around a set of tasks which lead up to the project. 
The project itself could take any length of time, as is the nature of project-based learning, but you can set these parameters with your students when discussing how the project will work in your classroom. In addition to working with their peers, planning and executing the project, Students will also take time to reflect on the execution and the, of the project and on their learning. Well worth having a look at that. And lastly, we'd like to draw your attention to one more program that's been developed to work alongside the on and off field modules. Healthy Kicks is a program that has been developed with Coles and focuses on the benefits of healthy eating and nutrition. It's a five week program for years F to six that explores the five food groups. The importance of fueling the body before and after exercise, meal planning, food and culture, and how to get creative in the kitchen. There's also a set of at-home learning activities that you can send home with your students or email to parents in order to get them involved too. For those interested in reading more about play-based learning that we touched on earlier, we do recommend this article. You might want to check it out. And that brings us to the end of our session today. A huge thank you to all the teachers from across the country who've joined us here. We hope you've got some useful takeaways from the session and that you're able to facilitate AFL with your students into the future. All of the resources that have been discussed today can be found at the website on the screen, www.play.afl forward slash schools forward slash teacher resources. And if you teach more than one year group or are interested in learning about other AFL skills, make sure you uh, check out the other resources that are available for other classes too. And before we go, we must thank our guests. What a wealth of knowledge and experience you bring. We've been really fortunate to have you join us today. Feedback on this session is welcome, and we will be sending out a survey to gather your thoughts and opinions. It will only take a few minutes of your time, but it helps us to improve our offerings for teachers in the future. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Bye all.